Well, good morning, Adventure Church. It's so good to be with you guys uh, virtually again this morning, and uh, hopefully pretty soon here we won't have to be saying that anymore. So we're really praying for that day uh, to be coming soon. But until then, let's just remember why we have gathered uh, this morning together, even if just in our living room separately. Uh, we come together to just remember the Lord and who He is and what He's done. And so uh, in Psalm 13, Verse 5, it says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love, because my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. So let's just sing um, about that and remember that this morning.
Well, thanks Kayla and Emily for leading us in worship today and, and welcome to this venture worship service online. Thanks for, for joining us today. I have just a couple of announcements to share with you. The first of which is that Aaron Milligan and Taryn Clark, as of yesterday, are now Aaron and Taryn Milligan. So congratulations to them if they're watching from their honeymoon, although I don't expect them to be. We'll let them play virtual hooky from church just this once, but we are excited for them. Also, continue to be in prayer for our plans to reopen our live services. As, as many of you know, I met with some city officials this past week, and we're trying to figure out the timing with them for re resuming our use of the Chatney Center. But in the meantime, we're exploring temporary alternatives uh, until then. And uh, so we'll keep you updated. Uh, so continue to pray for that. Well, it seems like the pandemic has been overshadowed this past week by the violence and chaos that has been happening due to racial tensions in our country. And we need to be in prayer, asking God to heal our nation in this time. So let's pray together. Father, we know that you are the God who rules over the affairs of, of humanity. And that even in times of crisis and chaos, you are there. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would heal the wound that has been opened in our nation. We pray against the, the evil of racism and injustice that has affected so many people for so long. And we long for the day, Lord, when your peace reigns over all things. And now, Lord, thank you for your word and how it feeds and nourishes our souls. Uh, I pray that as we look at what your word says today, that you would help us to hear it clearly and to apply it effectively to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, it's been 20 years since the movie Castaway came out in theaters. Man, it, it doesn't seem that long ago. But it's the story of a FedEx executive, Chuck Nolan, played by Tom Hanks, who is stranded for years on a deserted island without anyone else. And he's isolated and alone <clears throat> until Wilson comes along. Now, Wilson is a volleyball that washes ashore, and, and Nolan paints a face on it, names him Wilson based on the, uh, the, its brand, and Wilson, <clears throat> Wilson becomes his make-believe friend and companion. <clears throat> so they have many deep conversations, though pretty one-sided. They take long walks on the beach, they sit around the campfire, but before Wilson, this guy was lost in aloneness, and, and this volleyball played a very important role, even if it was imaginary, in providing companionship and, and ironically, sanity. The irony being that a grown man regularly talking to a ball seems pretty strange, but it was actually what kept him from going off the deep end. Well, one critic described the movie <clears throat> as a moving exploration of what happens when everything we hold on to is taken away from us. Now, we may not be experiencing that to the same extreme, but one of the things that the movie illustrates is that when the thing that is taken away is community and relationships, life becomes very difficult. People need other people, especially people with whom they can share life. Well, for most of you, I probably don't have to do too much convincing that this is one of the things that has become quite obvious in this time of isolation and quarantine, that we need to be around people. And unless you're a hardcore introvert, uh, you have probably missed to some degree the community of church, friends, co-workers over the past two months. I know for some members of my family, the ability this past week just to go to Hobby Lobby and walk around with fellow lobbyers was an exhilarating moment of freedom and, and solidarity. Uh, last week, we explored how one primary purpose of Christian community is to worship God collectively, together. 
that focuses on the vertical relationship we as a group of people have with God and how we respond to who he is and what he's done corporately. Today, we look at the other aspect of, of Christian community, which uh, is how we need and relate to one another on a horizontal level, living together with fellow Christ followers who are on the same journey of growing in Christ. And it's in that community of faith that we help each other uh, grow spiritually. And I can't think of any passage of Scripture that better defines this purpose of, of Christian community than Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. So turn there in your Bibles with me, if you would. Now, of course, uh, many of us know verse 25 as the go-to verse in the Bible to scold Christians who skip church a lot of the time. And it is useful for that, by the way. But in the context of this passage, and in the whole book of Hebrews, for that matter, it is related to who we are as Christians and what Christ has done for us that makes our devotion to gathering together so important. So let's read it. Verse 19 begins, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. So here's the main idea of this passage. Because Christ has opened the way for us to God, we must live a life devoted to God, anchored in truth and hope, and dedicated to encouraging one another's spiritual growth. Now, up to this point, the writer of Hebrews is presenting the truth that Jesus is better, better than angels, better than anything that the Mosaic law could accomplish, better than the priests and high priests of the Jewish faith, who were the human intermediaries between God and his people. And it's all about the fact that Christ is supreme. Therefore, his sacrifice on the cross was supreme for a lot of reasons. One being that it opened the way for people to access God in relationship with him by breaking the barrier that, that, that stood between us and God, namely our sin. So, because Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, you see the Old Covenant or Old Testament was never intended to provide eternal salvation from sin, but instead to, to point us to Jesus, and because Jesus is an infinitely better high priest who goes before us and, and bridges the gap between God and us, we are called to live in those realities. So, verse 19 begins with, Therefore, brothers, since... So, there's something coming that is, that is in response to what has already been stated. That, that Jesus is our supreme mediator of a supreme covenant between God and people, and he has made the way for us to enter into relationship with God. Now, these two things form the basis of how we should respond or live, the, the reason we should do what we're being called to do here in this passage. So since we know these things, there is a practical response on our part. So, what are the things we know? Well, the first is this. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Well, that's the first thing that 
uh, or the first reason for what we ought to do. Because we know, number one, we can confidently enter God's presence because Jesus has opened the way for us. Those holy places are what are represented by the most holy place or the holy of holies in the Jewish temple where God's presence was in all of his glory. And that place was only accessible to the Jewish high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. And there was a thick veil separating that place from the main chamber of the temple. But by his blood, in other words, by Jesus' death, Jesus opened for us the privilege to enter into God's presence with confidence. So it was by a new and living way. The old way, through the law and the intervention of human priests, the previous covenant, has passed. And it has given way to something new and living because as death was both defeated and fulfilled the payment for our sin by Christ, so also his resurrection makes this way one that is living because Jesus is alive. And that was vividly illustrated by God when at the very moment uh, that Jesus declared, it is finished and died on the cross, it's documented in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels that the veil in the temple spontaneously tore into opening up the Holy of Holies. And then, since we have a great high priest over the house of God. So number two, Jesus is the ultimate high priest who stands before God on our behalf. These two things are the basis of what is to come in the following verses. So here we see again, Jesus is the ultimate high priest who stands before God on our behalf. So not only has Jesus opened the way, he is the way. And he goes before us to lead us into God's presence as our mediator and intermediary. So that it's on the basis of who Jesus is and what he's done that we can enter into relationship with God and stand before him with confidence and assurance that the blood of Jesus has covered our sin. So it's on the basis of those two things that Christ has done for us that we're called to, number one, draw near. That is the first of three actions this passage calls us to. So look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In essence, it's saying because we have confidence through the person and work of Christ, draw near to God. He has opened that way for us and given himself as the one who goes before us and stands with us in the presence of holy God. Now, this is not only a command, but an invitation to intimate fellowship with God. Now, there are two reasons that God sent Jesus to be our sacrifice for sin. The first was that in his justice, God had to punish sin. The second was that he loves us and desires fellowship with us. So how are we to draw near? Well, first, it's with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with a heart that is genuinely devoted to God, that is humble before God, and with a faith and trust in God that is characterized by full assurance, and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So he has already, for the Christian, cleansed us from evil and sin. Uh, since this letter was first written to Hebrews, uh, Hebrew believers or Jewish believers, this brings to mind for them the ritual of cleansing that was part of their visits to the temple to worship and offer sacrifices to God. So we have been cleansed. 
Now, for many Christians who still struggle with guilt and fear of condemnation from God, this is a gentle invitation to come close to God, to press in to His embrace with a sense of meekness and confidence. Confident that Christ and what He did on the cross for you was fully sufficient, enough to purify you and justify you in the sight of God. Not to be repelled like you would with an executioner, but, but instead to be held like a child by your gracious, merciful, heavenly Father. And then we're called to hold fast. That's the second thing, number two. Verse 23 says this, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This is the second imperative or thing that we're called to do, to cling tightly to what we believe that is the foundation of our hope of relationship with God that will be for eternity. So the phrase, hold fast, simply relates to the essential things that we believe about God and salvation. The Greek word for hold fast is kateko, and it's the word from which we get catechism. Now these are the things that we resolutely hold together to be true, the things we believe that define us as essentially Christian. So the Westminster Catechism, for instance, is a compilation of those truths that we believe that define our faith and what it means to be Christian. They are the essentials of the Christian faith around which we unite as a community of believers. They are the truths that we hold in common and that identify us as Christian. So we're to hold tightly to those truths that are the basis of our hope without wavering, steadfastly. Now, why can we do that? Well, it's because of the character of God. It's because God is the one who has promised uh, us eternal life through Jesus Christ. And He is faithful. He will not fail to fulfill what He has said. So, we're to draw near to God, and to hold fast to what we believe that is the source of our hope. And because of what we believe, we're called to mutual encouragement within the Christian community. So we're to, number three, motivate and encourage one another to spiritual growth. Verse 24 says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So to consider here means more than just to casually think about. Uh, it means really to focus intently and constantly and actively upon how to help each other walk and grow as fellow Christ followers and, and to care for each other. And to stir up simply means to motivate. That's what we're to do with each other, to, to motivate one another to lives of love and good works. Well, if you've ever been to a youth baseball game, there are usually those good parents and other spectators who are constantly motivating and encouraging in a good way by yelling to the kids out on the field. Things like, keep your eye on the ball, or, or just get an easy base hit, or throw to second. Not yelling at the kids, but cheering for them to, to do their best, uh, to make the, the right play, etc. Well, as Christians, we constantly need cheering on to keep our eye on the ball, uh, to move to the next base, to work out our faith and love for God through loving others and doing good. See, we need encouragement to keep moving forward in our relationship with God, uh, in walking with Christ. And that is what Christian community 
is supposed to look like because of who Christ is and what he has done for us. See, these are not just a handful of unrelated or isolated exhortations, but they are closely interwoven, and each is dependent upon what comes before. See, it's because of who Christ is and what he's done that we can draw near to God. And in that access and close fellowship with God, we persevere in the faith, holding fast to the confession of our hope, to what we believe. And that access is not just experienced on an individual level. Those truths that we hold tightly to are not held in isolation. You see, these are the things that, that form the basis of our community, the things that bring us together. You see, that means that it is imperative that we actually meet together. So, because encouragement cannot take place in isolation, it goes on to say in verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That essential community is one that must exist in an environment of mutual stimulation to growing in Christ. You see, that's a central function of the body of Christ or the church, to build one another up in Christ. And, and that activity in the church is to take place with an eye on Christ's return. That, that kind of mutual encouragement while being actively involved in Christian community, that requires interaction. And it's something that we do all the more as we see the day drawing near. And that's referring to Christ's imminent return. Now, in these days, when we have been experiencing a necessary separation from each other to some extent, we need each other in order to be an encouragement to each other. And, and tragically, in this past week, as the subject of racism has become front and center, even eclipsing the news of the pandemic, there are brothers and sisters in Christ who need encouragement, who need to know that they are part of a community that supersedes the divisions that are part of this evil world system, but that we are one in Christ, bound together by love and a mutual caring for one another. So, because of who Christ is and what he has done for us, we are brought together under him as a worshiping community, community and as a community that functions to help each other grow spiritually by being together. So without those two essential aspects of Christian community, the corporate worship of God and the mutual edification of each other, no one can thrive as a Christian. And, and the Christian life will always be lacking and disconnected to, to some degree, not just from other Christians, but also from God himself. The redwood trees that are found in our state are said to have a relatively shallow root system. But the massive weight of these giant trees is in large part supported by the interlocking of roots with those other trees, uh, those other redwoods around them. And that's how they survive those coastal and mountain winds. Well, we need to be interlocked at the roots with other believers in order to withstand the storms that are part of living in this world. Now we need to make sure that we don't miss the gospel in this passage. The, the privileges and, and benefits of community are only possible because of who Christ is and what he's done. And it's only through his death on the cross that we have confident entrance into relationship with God. And it's only by virtue of that relationship that we are part of the community of faith. And so that relationship comes only through faith in Christ. So I would urge you, if you are not a follower of Jesus, come to faith in him.
to find forgiveness of sin and eternal life in a loving relationship with God. We need each other. So let's do all we can, while we can, to help and encourage one another to grow deeper and confidently drawing closer to God by being together as an essential community of growing, thriving followers of Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the community of faith. We thank you that you have placed us in a family of fellow believers who, with one mind, have a desire to serve you, to love you more deeply, Lord, to walk in love and, and good works as we've seen in this passage. I pray that you would help us to encourage one another in that spiritual growth, to become more and more like Jesus. And as we are encouraging one another, Lord, by gathering together, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be working in our midst, drawing us closer to you and closer to each other. For your glory, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing a new song, and it's written off of a verse in Psalm 27 that has been really encouraging to me during this time. And it's the verse that says, I believe I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And that's what this song is about. And it reminds us that um, the Lord has very good things in store for us as his church, um, both us as Venture Church and um, his church as a whole. So uh, let's just sing about this today.
reminded that you, all that you are is better than we could ever ask or imagine, and all that you are is what you've given us, Lord, and so I pray that we would just turn our eyes upon you today um, as we just go on with our day and begin our week, Lord. I pray that you would be over it, Lord. Lord, we want in everything Christ to be preeminent, Lord. So be over our hearts, be over us as a people, Lord. We look to you. In your name we pray. 